So I want to talk about topological field theories with boundaries, although I really want to talk about something else. I want to start talk first about spin systems, and I want to talk about spin systems first as sum up in one dimension and then in two dimensions. This is work with a couple of people, in particular with people from Ghent and uh, a few years ago, I would have said from Ghent and from Vienna, but these days, these are people from Ghent. Um, so, uh, let me start with the following thing. Um, so, let's fix a finite dimensional vector space. Uh, I could say a Hilbert space, actually a little bit less would work as well. We need a spa vector space with a non-degenerate pairing, bilinear pairing with itself. Um, this aspect in a moment. Um, so then um, we construct something that's very classical. So we take a one-dimensional structure, a chain, for example, with periodic boundary conditions, and then we associate to this um, um, a by taking a copy of our space H and taking the tensor product over it. And of course, this grows exponentially in the number of vertices I have in my chain. And it's a very classical construction um, to get states in such a Hilbert space in the following way. So um, we fix some auxiliary vector space and all these vector spaces are finite dimensional. And um, the basis is here just for being explicit. There's no need to choose a basis basically. And then you fix a matrix, uh, a matrix which has two indices in the auxiliary space. So these are the indices M and N and one index in our physical Hilbert space J. And then um, um, you can construct a state by simply contracting with a trace and matrix multiplication over the indices, so MN that has disappeared, and then summing over the Hilbert space index to get a specific state. And this encodes a family of states in very few parameters, at least not exponentially growing in N. And um, this is something people have been doing in various communities um, related to condensed matter physics and mathematical physics for many years. Typically, such a thing is frequently represented by looking, representing this uh, matrix, um, which I really want to see the index tensor or alternatively as a linear map from H tensor V tensor V to say the complex numbers. Let's work over the complex numbers uh, in by looking at this as a three um, legged gadget and contraction here um, is denoted by linking these uh, vertices which we have for A, oops, uh, by linking them uh, with um, uh, links. So A would be this here and to imagine to have H here and V. There's no dynamic specified. You could construct Hamiltonian such that this is the ground state. Here I take the point of view that just want to specify an interesting subspace of states. I'm not going to explain why they are interesting. Um, typically, people can would now start to explain about um, uh, some entropies and area laws for them, area in the right sense. Let's simply take the, that I want to single out an interesting subspace of the space of states. And that's, of course, interesting to construct quantum codes. This is one dimensional. And uh, there is an alternative uh, point of view which explains an, um, an abbreviation I will use frequently, um, namely the following thing. Place at each side of our one-dimensional lattice, so this is a side, this is a side, this is a side, place um, the tensor product of V with itself. And then take neighboring copies of this V and uh, project onto a maximally entangled state alpha. So this is our maximally entangled state, project onto it, which of course implicitly takes care of the summation. And then the one-dimensional PEPs can be seen as a map in this way. And remember that all our vector spaces have um, 
a scalar product, or rather they have a non-degenerate bilinear pairing, which allows us to raise and lower indices or to identify a vector space in its um, space. Yeah? I was a bit lost in this transparency, so I understood these states from before, and, and now what are you doing? I'm just describing the situation in a, in a different way. So before I was introducing this uh, tensor here as a matrix, right, with two indices M and N, which were belonging to the uh, to V and some index J. And now I'm uh, drawing this in a way that I'm taking here this uh, pro tensor product of vector spaces and projecting on such a state and I'm just doing this for the only single purpose to explain that um, uh, this tensor which I have here is called in the literature a PEPS tensor so it's a projected entangled pair state I just want to explain those, uh, uh, the abbreviation PEPS by reformulating the model in this way if you dislike this reformulation, um, don't worry, I'm not going to use it anyhow. I just wanted to explain the word PEPS. Yeah. Thank you. And I wanted to use it to point out that in two dimensions you can do something similar. And uh, so we can now uh, do the following one thing. We think about a spin system which we have um, on somehow this is reacting differently than I expected so which we have each time I'm drawing I'm now getting um, changing my own um, uh, screen in particular if I do it um, I can draw horizontally vertically but not horizontally kind of strange okay uh, then let me say it in words um, so we have here a square lattice on each of these square lattices, uh, on each of the vertices of the square lattice, we have a copy of our physical Hilbert space H. And imagine this, um, um, this line sticking out of the plane of drawing. And then we again introduce an auxiliary space uh, V. So we have here our physical Hilbert space V, H, and we have our auxiliary space V. And if I draw such a line, I'm contracting indices along the V. And in this way, I get, again, by a similar prescription, um, um, a vector space in H to the N, where N is the number of vertices in uh, our lattice. And of course, it's not necessarily a lattice. It could be just any triangulation of any two-dimensional manifold. And at this point, uh, the problem is in principle pure linear algebra or multilinear algebra, and there's not too much reason, there are not too many reasons to be interested in this as a mathematical physicist. So we have to somehow enrich the setup. And let me explain how this is done. So uh, we take it really serious that this is a two dimensional system. So what we want to consider here on top of this uh, physical Hilbert space H at any of these edges that are sticking out and um, on top of our auxiliary vector space we want to keep track of symmetries and we start with the symmetries in the same naive linear algebra way by saying um, symmetries in a two-dimensional system should be encoded in terms of line defects so this is something that's known in different contexts, for example, rational CFTs uh, for more than 15 years, that line defects are a very natural thing to encode symmetries of two-dimensional systems. So what we do is very much in the same spirit that we include this additional red structure, these lines, and these lines can now cross the vertices of our um, uh, two-dimensional lattice and remember that this two-dimensional lattice um, that there the edges are labeled by the auxiliary space V. So at each of these vertices uh, of the lattice we had a tensor, we had this PEPS tensor which means that we had a map from V in our case here fourth power tensor H 
to the com uh, complex numbers. Now, we have a new type of vertex here, which is a vertex where a red line crosses a, a black line. So here, and let me simplify the situation a bit by not working anymore on a square lattice, but going to a hexagonal lattice. Um, so we have one ingredient, which is here, this, the PEPS tensor with V, V, and H at the line sticking out. And we have a new ingredient, which is this uh, MPO um, symmetry. So which, since the black lines are associated to a, a V and the red lines are associated to a new type of vec uh, new vector space W, which is again a vector space with some bilinear pairing. So uh, we have now a new ingredient, which is this tensor from V, second tensor power, tensor W, ten second tensor power to C. So, and uh, they should inc uh, include, uh, describe the symmetries of the system in a way that I will explain more and more during the talk. So, this was V, uh, W, and W. I, and I can look at this um, tensor in several different ways. So, for example, I can say I'm fixing a vector in V tensor V, and then it gives an endomorphism of W. And I take all these endomorphisms and I assume, and I take the algebra that is generated by all these endomorphisms. The assumption that's implicit in much work in the field is that this um, sub-algebra of n to v is a semi-simple algebra, so it is a sum, a direct sum of matrix algebras. And as a consequence, since this is a direct sum of matrix algebras, we decompose W into a direct sum of invariant subspaces. Well, invariant subspaces which have the additional property that uh, um, the pairing behaves well with respect to this decomposition. That's why I call this an orthogonal invariant subspaces. And you see the first higher structure appearing with hindsight, namely... So, so in invariant with respect to what? I, I missed this. With respect to the action of this algebra BW, this is a, a sub-algebra of N uh, of W, and of course it acts on this space W, and now you can wonder are there invariant subspaces of um, this, um, this uh, algebra in W. Uh, right, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so um, I'm decomposing this. I have a simple algebra, this is a bit of overkill, but uh, at the moment, yeah, and uh, the labels I have here are, of course, uh, in bijection with the isomorphism classes of the simple representations of um, this algebra, yeah. So, um, um, this is, uh, so we start to, uh, to have some category in the game. There's one more question, one moment. Yeah. So, um, I missed that, but the vector spaces are all uh, finite dimensional, right? They are all finite dimensional and they all come with a non-degenerate pairing with, it, with themselves. Okay, thank you. So imagine finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but I won't exist in positive semi-definite and sesquilinear for our purposes. Yeah. Okay, so um, now this tensor has an obvious symmetry between the red and the blue uh, and the and the black line so what i can do is i can do the same game again so it gives also an endomorphism of um v once i fix vec a vector in uh, w tensor w and i'm again decomposing and I get another set of labels, and a priori, the set of labels for um, W and the set of labels for V, th there's no, no relations. They are not the same. There's no reasonable way to identify them, or there's no natural way to identify them. Okay, now we have to analyze this even further. And um, 
our symmetries should be topological. So if we have these defects which fuse and which should encode the as which encode the, um, the symmetry, they should they are, they should be topological so they can fuse. That's the first thing I'm assuming. If they fuse, they can fuse in different ways. And I fear degeneracy spaces whose dimension should be given by certain fusion rules. And this fusion should be also um, topological in the sense that um, um, you, um, if you have here one line in our uh, physical uh, lattice with this auxiliary space V, you can pull it through such a fusion tensor, which implies that fusion is something in which states um, in W, which are in the same subspace, behave in the same way, informally speaking. So what you start to see is that I'm heading towards the fact that uh, this category um, I was introducing on W, this category C, will become a fusion category. So, um, which, um, um, oh. yeah. May I uh, interrupt for some very basic question? So, in, in, in what sense defects correspond to symmetries? I, I would r think rather the opposite way. In, in physical system, if a defect, it just breaks some symmetry. So, in, in what sense uh, well, is this I, symmetry? Yeah. I was alluding to some very old insight here. And um, uh, what is the thing we have seen in uh, uh, CFT for the first time? Suppose you have a defect which has, for simplicity, and uh, this depends essentially on what notion of symmetry you have, uh, which has the property that there is some other defect, um, the twiddle, such that I can um, decompose, uh, I, uh, these two configurations of defects locally are the same. So this would be something one has all rights to call an invertible defect. In this case, if you have, if you give me any physical system, say, on um, some um, sphere, then I can insert a little loop labeled by this defect. Um, if everything is finitely semi-simple, then this just changes things by the quantum dimension of the defect. Now let's assume that we have, moreover, um, some something like field insertions here. So I can take this defect and um, I can um, pull it at this part on the other side of the sphere so that after a while the defect, if I'm pulling it through, it looks as follows. Right? And it, it closes on the other side of the sphere. This is a contour deformation. Now, since here the defect goes in these two directions, I can change this by closing the loop here and closing the loop here. And what has happened globally is the following thing, that my configuration, which had four field insertions, now looks as follows. This encircles the fields, and my defect now goes in this way. OK? And now I do this again, and the fields have transformed. This is a pretty stable thing uh, how to identify um, um, certain symmetries and to realize them in terms of defects which have to be invertible and topological. It, yeah, and uh, so this is. Yeah. The I think I understand the idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now um, we have these defects and they should be able to fuse. I've been using this right away when I explained what they, it means that they're vertible. So I have these additional degeneracies. I have degeneracy spaces here, um, which I could give a name. Actually, I won't use the name, so that's why they are not on the slides. And the second thing I have is I can also pull a defect through such a vertex of my physical lattice, because the defect should be topological. So this implies um, compatibilities between uh, these red indices and, of course, also the black indices. So these are indices alpha, alpha, beta, gamma, which belong to this other fusion category in the game. So 
um, uh, now I have coupling spaces and um, it is a very natural assumption to say that if I do multiple recoupling that this is not independent. So if I choose couplings here and here and here and here, they are related by some isomorphism or put differently. There is a decent set of 6J symbols and 6J symbols, of course, um, um, behave reasonably if you have on top of a pentagon axiom. So um, this is all the things you need to say that these um, actually these invariant subspaces of this auxiliary space which we introduced in this tensor network formalism should be objects of a fusion category and to be well behaved to have dimensions for example in a well behaved way um, a spherical fusion category and similarly the auxiliary space gives rise to a second fusion category so what I should emphasize by this argument is that from the spin networks, uh, this tensor network approach and their symmetries, if you analyze them carefully, you are getting very, in a very natural way two different fusion categories. And there's a question on how they are related. And let's uh, analyze this. So these are the compatibility relations I was showing earlier. Yeah, so th this here has indices alpha, beta, and gamma. And now look, I have here two coupling spaces, and I have here one, two, three coupling spaces effectively. So this is a uh, two is equal to a, a relation between two coupling spaces and three coupling spaces. This is exactly what we had in the Pentagon, where um, the pentagon also gives relations of this type. So the idea is that we want to interpret these identities and these identities as pentagons. But these are pentagons in which different indices enter. Different indices enter because, for example, here we have our physical Hilbert space H sticking out of our plane and here we have the auxiliary vector space and here we have the W. So we have a zoo of two categories. We have uh, several uh, Hilbert spaces and we, we are looking for uh, enough mixed pentagons between them. And there is a very natural framework in which you can find this. And this natural framework um, is known from um, um, local rational CFT. It also appears in subfactor theory. It is um, um, speaking in the really appropriate context. It is really a bicategory with two objects. So what is a bicategory? It's like a category, but the endomorphisms are not sets, but categories. So uh, the homo the home spaces are not. Uh, sets but categories. So I fear one object and actually this object comes with its own endomorphisms. Endomorphisms can be composed. So I can compose the objects of this category D. This is a tensor product on the object. So D is a monoidal category and similarly the endomorphisms of the black dot, they also form a monoidal category. And, um, well, endomorphisms of two different objects in a category can be rather different uh, monoids. And in the same way, I have here as the endomorphism categories, two rather different monoidal categories. Well, actually, I have more. I have here a home from the black to the white dot. And I can pre-compose a morphism or post-compose it. So this means... Um, um, um. Christoph, it is, a, yeah? is, is it correct that the morphisms of C and of D are the black and the red arrows? Is it this the idea or not? No, it's a bit more complicated and I will explain this on the next uh, next slide. Yeah. Okay. So uh, for this reason, uh, I'm now drawing in red, but um, I'm drawing everything in red. So what I'm drawing in red doesn't have any meaning like the red that's on the slide. So. Um, probably I should draw in a color that's not in the slide. Yeah, so for the moment in this figure, there's no direct red and no direct blue, uh, uh, black, yeah? And um, 
I will uh, restrict here to a minimality requirement, namely that um, this morphism is invertible in the appropriate sense, and there is a notion of an invertible bimodule, and uh, actually this means that two monoidal categories, they are not the same, but they are related by a categorical variant of Morita theory. All this is very well understood mathematics, and what I want to do is now, from this context where I have actually um, one endomorphism monoidal category, another mono, uh, endomorphism monoidal categories, and module categories. And a module category means that I have more uh, a mixed tensor product in this way and a mixed tensor product of C in this way. It is associative and uh, the associator uh, satisfy a mixed pentagon. I want to construct exactly from this context the gadgets I need to have such uh, a spin model, the PEPs, and all the stuff. And this is done on the next slide. And now, so we have this two object by category with all these gadgets. And now I'm doing the following thing. I have to provide you with some physical vector space. And this physical vector space has a the odd form. Uh, but it turns out to be out the correct one. I take a sum over the simple objects of this uh, one fusion category. And I take the corresponding home spaces, which are, of course, vector spaces, and a bit more than vector spaces. They come with pairings uh, due to the pivotal structure. And I take the direct sum, and this is my physical vector space. Remember, that's the one that is sticking out of the plane of drawing. Then I have to provide for you the auxiliary vector space V. And now to come back to Thomas' question, right? This is the vector space which had the lines in black. Yeah. And this vector space is obtained as follows. Um, I take an object A in my module category. I take an object in my category D. And then there was a mixed tensor product, which I'm writing in this way. I could have, I think I take a darker color for this. I could have equally well written A tensor alpha and understood a mixed tensor product, but I, I'm thinking about this as an action. And again, I'm summing over all simple objects, and this gives me a, an auxiliary vector space and the MPO symmetries. So this was the thing which was in red in the lines. That's obtained by not taking the right action of D, but rather the left action of A. And in this way, I get vector spaces. And now I have to write down for you the very answers. So what happens now is that the things I was drawing before by um, red lines only. So before I was saying the red lines can fuse and I was drawing this because this vector space W is now, um, I shouldn't have taken W, let me take something else, uh, sorry. Yeah, so because, um, yeah, now here this vector space V is now composed out of three objects, I need for V an A, um, and uh, I should, sorry, let me delete this. This here would be V. This is the black line. I need for V and capital A, a, a capital A, an alpha and a B. And you see here that for V, I have an A, an, an alpha and a B. And M is a basis vector in there. So these are, this is exactly the basis vectors over which I would contract the auxiliary space in this PEPS tensors. And, um, um, what I'm writing down here is a thing that's known. So these are exactly 6J symbols. And the 6J symbols will play uh, the role in this case of, um, well, this is the MPO tensor. Um, this here will be, here I have the auxiliary space. Here I have the auxiliary space. And here the physical space H is sticking out. It's the physical space because I have alpha beta and gamma. 
So this here will be the PEPS tensor. And the other thing will be the tensor that describes the fusion of the symmetries, of the MPO symmetries. So all you, this... You, you, yeah. Your A and V's are very special. Can, you ev can everything from before dis be described like this? Or it's just a particular subclass? Um, I would claim that um, there are pretty good arguments uh, that um, everything I um, um, mentioned before under the assumptions I mentioned. So, and remember, if we, have, if we make a clean mathematical physics argument, if we make a lot of assumptions. I was saying the action of this algebra is finitely semi-simple and so on. So I would say anything where you make a very reasonable set of assumptions, uh, any system of this type can be described in this form. I see. Interesting. Yeah. So that there is a very large and natural class of these spin models, which is described in terms of this bicategorical structure, in terms of one monoidal category, another monoidal category, and a module category between them. So there's an underlying higher structure in these spin uh, systems, and that's why this uh, is kind of appropriate for this conference. Uh, but let's go a little bit further, and um, let's summarize this. So if we, we had reduced everything for the moment to hexagonal lattices, or rather to three valent vertices, and um, we have a spin model where we could construct the individual spaces in terms of home spaces and where the PEPs is given in terms of a categorical structure in terms of these 6J symbols. And then we can do the business you do with tensor network states. You are contracting them to get distinguished states, to get a distinguished subspace of states. And um, I should say that if you think about this as the physical space and we feed it in and we have some D, then the category C we get um, um, is not unique. So we can get by choosing different modules categories or different Morita equivalent categories, we can get different Pepsis. And if you contract these Pepsis, you will get different states. So you will see always a different subset of symmetries. And of course, this calls for some field theoretic explanation. And um, But let me say this again. So um, the symmetries are, are not unique. So we get different. Um, uh, you can think about the choice of this um, given the physical state, the choice of the other category C the Morita equivalent category as kind of choosing coordinates to describe the system and certain things will be very explicit in certain coordinates and other things won't be. And between these coordinates there's a duality which has a very clear mathematical meaning. It's categorical Morita equivalence. So it's nothing we have to invent. And I will explain in a moment that again in parallel to the two-dimensional case, you can construct Hamiltonians. In our case, this will be, for example, levin wen Hamiltonians. But let, let's attack first the problem from a different angle. So I want to show that all the things I did have a very natural explanation in terms of a state sum TFT with boundaries, a state sum TFT of Turaev Vero type. That's essentially explaining also very naturally why this whole PEPS business works. And that's the last thing I want to explain in this talk. So um, let me say as a motivation, we want to go because three valent vertices and possibly even because beyond lattices. All these things shouldn't depend on choosing some lattice of a specific thing. We want to compute uh, to describe uh, topological ground states of systems of quantum computing, which should be irrelevant in the end of these details. So let me highlight in a very brief way uh, some aspects of the state sum construction, um, which uh, Toraev Vero, Bar uh, Barrett Westbury, actually I'm using the formulation in the book by um, Toraev and Virelissier. 
you know, in any state sum construction, you're choosing as an auxiliary datum, which is a triangulation, or technically it's a skeleton of a three manifold. And I'm not going to define what a skeleton is, but I hope that this gives you already some impression of what uh, a skeleton could look like. Now, um, in any state sum construction, you are first constructing on the two manifolds a big vector space, and then you are projecting to some subspace. This is very much in line with this idea of having a big vector space, actually, which depends on the skeleton, and a subspace which is independent on the skeleton. So these are hallmarks of any state sum construction. And um, what we are now going to do is we are going to extend uh, the prescription of Toralf and Virilisier slightly, or not slightly, quite a bit, and um, so that we can deal with three manifolds with boundary. And then we do a purely holographic strategy. So we want to describe such a spin net model on an oriented surface. So what we do is we consider a three manifold which is simply a cylinder over the surface. And one side of the cylinder has a boundary sigma. And here I take a physical boundary. And on the other hand, uh, I have um, another boundary, uh, which is a gluing boundary. That's a boundary on which the TFT induces a state. Yeah. So um, if I'm applying the standard uh, and the, uh, uh, the vector space, there's only a vector space assigned to this gluing boundary here, and the vector space should be such that we get here the ground states that we get by contracting PEPS tensors, and that the bigger space, which depends on the triangulation, is the one we get as a Hilbert space by the prescription I was showing earlier on. So, um, so the zero means that it's only PEP states, or what? And the zero means that it's only PEP states, and I'm a bit sloppy. I didn't really fully explain what PEP states means. So I have to take PEPs tensors, and I have also to take some of these tensors with the red lines, because if I'm just contracting the PEPs tensor, I will get a single state. But I want to get a, um, a system of ground states, a vector space of ground states. So that's what I would call PEP states. And, yeah, so here, then I apply the TFT ascription. Um, this gives me a state on the boundary. And what I want to show to you now is that the very natural TFT description gives actually exactly the peps, uh, these PEP states I was describing earlier. So let's do this. This is a, a crash course on to arrive Viro constructions. So what we do is we have this um, two, we have this uh, three manifold which has a boundary sigma and a boundary sigma. The gluing boundary is the one upstairs, and this here is a physical boundary. So um, then, you, one thing where you should be quite careful is I have vertices here on the gluing boundary, but I didn't draw any vertex on the gluing boundary on the physical boundary. Yes, there are vertices. Now, uh, I'm doing a state sum construction. So I have to assign degrees of freedoms. And maybe you expect degrees of freedom assigned to lines. Thinking about um, uh, BF models, you see that I could use a Poincaré duality and instead assign state sum variables not to lines. So the state sum variable is not assigned to this line. But I'm assigning state sum variables to plaquettes. And it's very well known by now in the TFT literature that a boundary condition is described by some module category. And um, I'm assigning now to the green plaquettes in the physical boundary, I'm assigning uh, state sum variables, which are objects in the module category. And to the blue plaquettes, which are in the interior, I'm assigning um, um, state sum variables in the category on which my model is built. That's the category called D earlier on. And now I go through um, the standard prescription. I have to assign, I have to find vector spaces. And the prescription is uh, any edge here it decomposes into two half edges. So it has two ends and 
an edge plus one of the ends that's called a half edge and what I'm doing is I go around such a half edge I'm looking what kind of variables I find so if I go around here I get alpha gamma beta it depends a bit on the sense on how you orient things so in this way I'm getting here for the half edge E0 I'm getting actually a vector space V0 and for the other half edge I'm getting also a vector space and it's important that this vector space is in duality to the uh, to the um, to the vector space assigned to the brother half edge so they are in duality and if we have two vector spaces in duality uh, we have a canonical vector in them so now I get from the skeleton a big vector space depending on the skeleton and um, I'm getting also a canonical vector in it now I have to produce a number or rather in the case where I have a vector space um, a vector in this vector uh, a gluing boundary a vector in this vector space and this is done in the TF in standard TFT by doing an evaluation around a vertex so you take the vertex you draw a little sphere around it and then these uh, plaquettes they give a line on the sphere and uh, so I'm getting here a line labeled by alpha here similarly I'm getting a line labeled by beta and I'm getting here on the sphere a line labeled by B and a line labeled by A and so on and in this way you see I'm getting a graph on the sphere and um, um, spherical diffusion categories come with a graphical calculus they are called spherical because you can do a graphical calculus on a sphere you evaluate it and you get a number I'm using this number to contract it and actually for a tetrahedral graph on S2 I'm getting a 6J symbol and this 6J symbol is of course just the 6J symbol I was selling you earlier on as the PEPS tensor so really the TFT tells you that there is a PEPS tensor here with two auxiliary legs and one leg pointing upwards that's why I was insisting so much that the physical Hilbert space points upwards well and now you evaluate it on your canonical vector then everything that's not connected to um, a, a vertex will survive anything that's connected to a vertex will be disappear in the evaluation so I'm ending just with these dangling edges on the gluing boundary and this was the Hilbert space for the spin system so in this way I actually get exactly by the state sum prescription a vector that is the same as the one by evaluating the PEPs um, by contracting indices so um, we have a completely holographic understanding of PEPs that is independent of lattices and that explains the whole PEPs things in a very natural by categorical setting okay my time is almost over we've been um, um, reminded that we should stick to time so let me say two things before closing the first thing is um, on this boundary of the three manifold there can be additional structure so there could be boundary Wilson lines and they will be exactly the MPO symmetries so the story goes on but it doesn't go on in 45 minutes yeah so that's completely in the picture and that's very important to get these symmetries and to get a richer set of PEP states and then uh, what I had prepared because you never know with online talks how quick you, you go is you can use exactly the same construction to do also representation theory and by exactly doing the same type of calculations you can show also explain the generalized Frobenius sure indicator of which was uh, investigated by many people in the community of Hopf algebras and tensor categories and you can understand it also by evaluating the um, uh, TFT manifolds with boundaries so my conclusion is very brief TFT on manifolds with boundaries is a very versatile tool that's one aspect from the TFT side from the PEP side yes PEPs are quite a bit more naturally than you think if you analyze them and you make a couple of very natural assumptions they are related to this bi-categorical structure and then 
the PEPS construction is completely explained in TFT terms. Thank you.